What's up guys, Cameron here, and on this episode of the MSP Show, I am joined by the great and powerful JC Lambrecht. He is the current EFC light heavyweight champion. He is also the co-owner of Bravo Tactical, as well as Sentinel of Nature. Enjoy. Cameron Simon, ladies and gentlemen. Oh! Ready to rumble, yo. Here we go. <laughs> Gila prepared a few videos for you to um, react on a little bit later in the episode. But just uh, seeing that it came from Reddit, I don't think it's going to be anything positive. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's good to have you in the studio, JC. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much for having me. Yeah, yeah. So from the start, you're putting me on the spot to review something, but yeah. that we'll get to. Yeah. Um, we actually wanted to buy you a toy gun and then have a little, <laughs> have a little target here. And okay. It, and if you don't shoot a bullseye, then nothing you say okay. going forward is uh, any, yeah, has any yeah. credibility. Exactly. So that's going to take away the credibility, yeah. but a toy gun will be for you. So, or so, actually, was it intended yeah, for me? For you. Oh, okay. But, uh, oh, okay. A toy gun. But, yes, a okay. toy gun. So we don't have a proper backstop wall. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it's going to go through. It's going to be a through and through. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a through and through. But okay. uh, yeah, Perfect. it's awesome to have yeah. you here. Uh, not only are you super successful in what you do outside outside the cage, but you are also the newly crowned EFC light heavyweight champion. How does that yeah. feel? Yeah, well, nowadays I think that's still it's still busy like setting in yeah. at the moment. Um, especially if you go back to the gym after a fight that I had in the last fight. Yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm still I'm deciding between either I'm going to show my belt or still like hide it underneath the table up until we had a good defense <laughs> on the belt. But yeah, uh, yeah it's a, it's a good feeling. It's something that uh, came a long way. It's mm -hmm. something that we've worked really, really hard for. So, so yeah. yeah, that is that is now actually also something that I can add behind my name. So we're glad we did it. Yes, the fight uh, was a tough one. It was a difficult fight. It was it was a hard one. But I think there's a reason why the fight happened the way it happened. So yeah, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. we're happy with that. Yeah, it's yeah. absolutely impressive that you you were also away for ten years. Yeah, I, I, exactly. I don't think people realize that. It's like after your fight with Drekas, uh, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, that you were basically you stopped yeah. after that fight. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, ten years later, decided to actually join then the team yeah. Yeah. of your former opponent, and then go out there and first face his brother exactly. and then f face the yeah. other brother for for the championship yeah how was that after 10 years how was it getting back into the cage yeah well let's just first talk about the 10 years so i feel bad for the sonya for the fight coming up because yeah. that took me 10 years to like just recap you know after i fought Rikas. <laughs> yeah. yeah and just like you know go through all the rehabilitation and so on no i'm just joking because yeah. <laughs> after 10 years that I was thought, also okay. a hard yeah a that hot. was a difficult one no yeah. but yeah of course all the respect to Rikas. that was a difficult that was a hard fight and so on mm. but yeah regarding everything that happened during that time and so on um, actually, to give you a bit of background, so the reason why we stopped fighting after that is because I also went to Namibia and it was difficult um, to stay in the pro game and so on and keep on fighting as I went to Namibia because then all the security stuff happened as well. But yeah, after 10 years, we stepped back into the coach and yeah, now it's it's looking positive to, to stay there for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Given your job outside the cage, I, I'm pretty sure you are used to quite stressful, very intense work. Does yeah. it translate into the cage, that, that pre-fight type of definitely. anxiety? Definitely, definitely. I must say from first when I fought back in the days, 2011 and so on in EFC, up until now and what we've done in between, most definitely prepped me for what I've seen now, basically in, let's call it, later on I'll talk about it a bit when we start to talk about Bravo Tactical Africa, but we always talk about a complex environment, like in the reality, what you see, what you do and so on, running around on the streets and in, in the field and so But I think that definitely prepped me for, for what we're facing in the coach as well, because um, I actually had this discussion with Mark as well before yeah. my first fight back against uh, last year, December, it was against Willem. Yeah, And I had this discussion, we were about to walk in and I'm like, this is nothing new. 
I'm mm. so composed because I've seen a lot in a complex environment. So walking into this cage, there's what there's nothing that's gonna kill me. It's just hands yeah. and feet and elbows, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> you can take it's, damage, you know, yeah. and hopefully you walk out alive. Punches are but, much uh, slower than a bullet. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Definitely, yeah. definitely, definitely. But uh, yeah, then it's bullets, it's hands, it's fists, it's knives, and so on. Talking about that, I I think it's a it's a good uh, good time to just. I've seen it lately on yeah. podcasts and so on you're not allowed to go to a podcast or do a podcast without the gift so i hope you got me something as well yes <laughs> i no, do but i got you something um just gonna take yes. it out of the bag we're not allowed to see the bags this is oh bag. yeah but uh what it is so before i hand it over uh recently i believe you received your license for glock 43x yeah so i thought it will be good to buy you a knife as well um it is a Glock knife, as you can oh, see. Oh, that so. is so <laughs> sick! What? So now you have a you have a Glock, basically a gun that's yeah. not gonna malfunction. Yeah. And now you have a Glock knife as well. So definitely, this is gonna stay sharp forever. That is insane. Because it's Glock. Wow, that <laughs> no, is so sick. I'm not getting sponsored by Glock. Yeah. But there's a there's a yeah. Glock knife for you. Now that you is... have a. Yeah, a Glock gun and a Glock knife. That as well. is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to all the uh, the. CZ yeah. guys out there for <laughs> for all those malfunctions. Yeah. Wow, that yeah. is insane. So so that is it. That because is this podcast is so all about violence, isn't it? A hundred percent. Well, it is now. <laughs> that, that is yeah. awesome. Yeah. That Look, is very typically cool. I feel uncomfortable sitting next to you, but now especially with a knife, I do. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> You're aiming to watch. <laughs> that is yeah. so sick. So, Thank yeah. you so much it's for this. It's a huge pleasure. It's so really a awesome. Knife and a Glock gun. You can add it to your Glock collection. That is yeah. awesome. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Pleasure. It's, it's um, a huge pleasure. It's, it's really, it's, it's great to see that not only are you very successful, we'll chat about Bravo Tactical yes. in a minute, but uh, the, the in-cage, uh, you know, as someone that sees you weekly, daily um, in training, it's absolutely, it's insane to see the amount of work you do in the gym. Yes. And I've been to to your to your courses as well, and it, it's it's a very taxing on the body. And I can't even exactly. imagine you doing you do that every single day. You have private classes. You you have these um, CPOs that you train in the week, and then you have like these weekend courses where you do that. And then on top of that, you need to still train. Exactly. How do you make the the mental switch when you get to the gym? when when you know okay you are facing this guy it is for the title it, it was that qu quite a hard transition to really get all your ducks in a row for this title fight yeah i must say definitely um i thought the title fight is going to come a bit later reason being is because only now after the title fight we started we started at least trying to get in more support so that i can spend more time on the mats because leading up to the title fight I had mostly two sessions a week. Mm -hmm. Not talking about normal gym, um, gym, sorry, gym and cardio sessions and yeah. so on and so forth. But I'm talking about MMA sessions on the mat, spending time on the mats with other fighters as well. I had mostly two sessions a week. Yes. Okay. And then leading up to the fight, I tried to push for free with yes. regarding the time that I had available. So that's what I actually had, not just for the title fight, but the previous two as well, as I fought his brother, Kulukane, and as I fought Willem as well, end of last year, I had mostly two sessions on the mat prepping for the fight. Yeah. So I'm saying, yeah, I've been at CIT now for most probably more or less a year. Yes. But if we count the sessions on the mats, I've been there for about four weeks. <laughs> yes, that's, that is insane. So yeah, yeah it's, it was difficult for me as well because I actually said it after, after my fight, before I had the title fight, I said, listen, yeah, I want to I wanna go for the title, but I definitely want to spend more time on the mats because currently we're going 24-7, yes. nonstop. And now, as I said, we're, getting, we're trying to get in more support so that I can spend more time on the mats. Not saying I'm not going to present courses or the same amount of courses under Bravo Tactical Africa, but we want to at least looking at the stuff that I do throughout the week. Yes. I can make that a bit less and I can focus upon the training that I do over weekends. And then throughout the week, I want to be on the mats five days a yeah. week. So that over weekends, yes, I can still pre present courses. But yeah, it's difficult because it's still 24-7. You're on, yes. the, on the mats and you know the sessions that we do every single day, doing that five days a week. And then Saturday and Sunday, I mean, when we're on the range, you're standing on the range for six to eight hours. We yeah. run the courses full day Saturday, full day Sunday, Monday, we're back on the mat. Yeah. It's just what it is. We just have I, to deal with it. We yeah. just have to organize it now as it is and try to, to just, 
you know, fight with what we have. Yeah, I remember <laughs> that for first course I did, the vehicle injured shooter oh, course. Yes. Yeah, you jumped in on the deep side. On yeah, that one. deep side. <laughs> and I was like, Laka, didn't, yeah. I didn't know the setup as well. Didn't know you need to really bring a lunch or a snack. I was yeah. very naive <laughs> as to how long the course is going to be as well. Exactly. Eight hours in the rain, in yeah. the mud. Yeah, um, it's good you're saying rain and mud because the conditions yeah. was insane it, it on was, that day. It was yeah. insane. And I just couldn't, I was I was so dead tired. I think it was a Saturday yeah. that I joined. Yeah. That Sunday, you you just did that again. Yeah. Just once, yeah. <laughs> once yeah. again. I And I was dead tired. I, I got sick uh, on that day out, yeah. but it was insane. And then you also told me, listen, Wait until you're here for eight hours in the sun. Yeah, like that's, yeah, no, that exactly. polishes you yeah. as well. Yeah. And we've done the marksmanship courses in the sun. It is, it is super intense. Yeah. It is really, it's taxing yeah. on the body. But uh, the amount of information that you take into those courses is is absolutely insane. Yeah. And uh, it's, um, I think it's like if you very much like your training when you go exactly. to, when you work with coach more or, or exactly. whatever coaches you want to work with it's it's about downloading as much data as you can exactly. and really working on that by yourself yes yeah. so taking in as much as possible yeah i always say it as well and i say it on the courses as well um training is like good life advice it's not about what you receive it's about what you do with what you receive yes it's the same as what we do on the training as well what we do on the courses is i always say I'm not going to make you a perfect shot just in mm. one day. Okay, nobody is going to teach you how to throw a perfect punch just in one day. Yes. It's not about what you're going to receive. Yes, of course, you need that knowledge as well. You need that experience from the, say, for instance, call it a coach or instructor or so on. Yeah. You need that knowledge. You need that background. You need that experience. But at the end of the day, you're building up your own system. Yes. It's about what you're going to do with what you receive. Whether you're going to put in the time or not, it's yeah. going to, at the end of the day, it's not going to depend on the instructor. It's not going to depend on the coach. Yes, they're going to make you much better, but it's going to depend a lot upon you as well. Yeah. What you're going to do with what you receive in that training session. Yeah. And as you said, something else that I want to mention is on that training as well. That day, it wasn't raining. It was raining. Yeah, it was <laughs> really <laughs> to, to describe it in a good <laughs> yeah. way. It was yeah. really raining. And we will, the only time we'll ever stop and it actually never happened before. We never, ever stopped the Bravo Tactical Africa course before is when there's thunderstorms. Okay. But if it's raining, if it's snowing, if it's sunny, it doesn't yes. matter what it is because you can't choose the conditions. Yeah. Okay. It's not going to be a, a set stage for you when you do get attacked. Hopefully never. Yes. But when you do get attacked, most probably the attacker is going to choose the stage. He's yes. going to set the stage. And yeah. most probably he's going to attack you in the form of being ambushed, caught flat for it and totally surprised. And then, especially in that scenario situation, you can't choose the environment. The environment's yes. going to choose you. Wherever yes. you are and wherever you do get attacked, you're going to have to deal with the environment. We always say in training as well, the environment's going to dictate the tactics. Yes. And that's it. That's oh, insane. So, so yeah, that's why we haven't stopped on that day when you you arrive there, jumping yeah. on in the deep end, skipping all the marksmanship courses. Because most people go the way you go. They always want to do the tactical stuff. They yeah. never want to learn the basics. Yes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think no, I was... But I, was, I know you are a true believer of the yeah, basics if 100%. I see how you fight and so on. Yeah, I know you are, but unfortunately on that one, you jumped in on the I was, side. Yeah, but I was also like, yeah, like a cause, like a, we're going to be pulling some tourniquets. But yes, I, I was very naive. Yeah, and... Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like you say, you can't really, you can't choose your environment. And I do think that exactly. in the buildup of your title fight, it was yeah, a thing of yeah. like, you got clear instruction. Like yeah. when some, when there are a bunch of, a group of people that believe in you more than you do in exactly. yourself, yeah. they believe that you are ready for that title shot. And I Definitely. think, you know, coach was, he was like, you don't have a choice. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. fighting for, for yeah. the world title. Yeah. And to then, you know, mentally prepare and I must say, like, I th you had a very good camp, but, but it was also quite a short, short yeah, camp. Yeah, the notice exactly. was short. Yeah. You know, so um, the, let's just talk a little bit about the fight itself. You know, um, how was it, f how was it a little bit of a different feeling knowing that it's for a title? Yeah. I must say it was a different feeling, but I tried to, to, as always, stay composed. And I must say I stayed composed as well in that fight, but it was definitely a different feeling. Why? Because it's something that I lived up to my entire life. It's something that I've been prepping for my entire life. And it's something, something that put huge pressure upon me, not just from the side of the gym. Like I knew I had to, to perform because of you and Rikas. Mm. You and Rikas are in the gym with me. And then of course, coach as well. I mean, you guys are performing 
and putting up shows in a world, I mean, at the UFC and so on, the biggest stage around the world. Yeah. And definitely that pressure coming from the gym was there. And of course, definitely not throwing away the CIT name and keeping the name there as well. So that pressure was definitely there. And then especially I have the world of respect for coach as well performing just for him as well so yes. whenever i do something wrong or if i don't perform and so on it feels like i'm putting it on him as well because i'm putting his name out there yeah so that pressure was huge but something that else that placed pressure on me and the reason why i fought the way i fought although i got knocked down knocked out most probably especially at second knockout people talk about me tapping so i went back and had a look of yeah. course not i knew i didn't tap i will yes. never tap because just of punches so i was so out on that when he when he knocked me out the second time my arms went straight and as he was punching this arm was bouncing like this yes so the arms were straight because of the knockout and yeah. this arm was was bouncing because he was throwing that punches and yeah but let's get back to the point the reason why i fought through it and the reason why the pressure was a bit different because i felt like i had to basically finish this for joshua that's my little boy little son he's three years old turning four now in september but uh, I always fought when I lost at the fight against Drikas, and that's why I told my wife again when we decided a few years, a few years ago, two years or so ago, we decided to move back. And I told her, listen, yeah, I'm going to step back into this. And Drikas actually, you actually opened up the door to talk to Drikas after you came to that first course. And Drikas yes. sent me a message, listen, yeah, we want some more big guys to train with in the gym. And I said, let's go. Yeah. And then before the end of the year, coach threw me into that first coach fight. But uh, I always said to Megan, one day Joshua is going to look at the old videos of the fights back in the day and the fights against Drikas and so on. And he's going to look up to me and he's going to ask me, listen, yeah, why didn't you finish this? Yes. What happened? Why yeah. did you just stop fighting? And I just knew I had to finish this for him. I just knew I had to take the, take the title. Because one day if I, wanna, if I wanna talk to him, sit down and discuss what it takes to be a champion, I can't tell him, I can't give him guidelines if I can call it that on how to be a champion if I wasn't a champion myself. Yeah. Okay. Then I'm just basically talking. I'm yes. not actually setting that example. Yeah. Well, now so, you can show him. Exactly. You can really yeah. Show yeah. Him. Now yeah. at least of just like telling him, listen, you yeah, be a champion. I'm not talking he needs to be a champion in whatever like sport or so on. He can be a champion in whatever he chooses to do in life. Yes. Okay. You can choose to be the best if you decide to do so and you have the faith to do so. You can be the best. But at least now I can show him that, listen, if you put in the work and you, you have the faith to do so and you put in the work and you work every single day and you put your mind to it, it is possible to have the out outcome, sorry, that we had a while ago. So, yeah, yeah. No, so I think that was the big pressure. And then leading up to that fight as well, one more. Yeah. Then, uh, <laughs> yeah, so leading up to that fight as well, my, and I said it actually in the interview after the fight as well, um, my little girl Mila said, Daddy, listen, I want to see that belt when you come Yo, back with that it. That is a lot of So every single time <laughs> yes. when I got knocked down, I thought of those words, Daddy, I want to see the belt tomorrow morning when I woke up. Yeah. And or I, when I wake up. And yes, I was just thinking of those words over and over and over and yeah. over. And then yeah, we just stood back up every single time and eventually we got the W. That's absolutely <laughs> it, it's it's insane. The amount yeah. of adversity that you went through during that fight. And I and I, I must say the, th that pressure, I do think, even though pressure can sometimes be um, connected as being a negative thing. Yes. But I do yeah. think that it's actually quite motivational to have that pressure on your shoulders of representing the team and coach yeah. very well. Yeah, and it's sometimes, you know, with every single fight, you want to go out there and you want to you want to put your team and your coach and you want to put yourself on the map. And exactly. um, it, it does apply a lot of pressure. I remember... Uh, my fight with Billy Westays. and yeah. he got me like broke my nose in the first round uh, got me in a guillotine and I exactly. still remember during the fight thinking like the blood was just like but it yeah. was squirting yeah. out of my nose Bumping and I just out. thought yo this is gonna look so shit on TV yeah. just thinking like <laughs> yeah, having look... that pressure as well <laughs> yeah, yeah. this yeah. looks so yeah. bad yeah. but it is it is a great motivational factor to to know that what you applied in training because we we go we go to hell and back in training yeah, and you yeah. know 
to to have that happen like you said you can't choose your environment so you, the knockdowns happened yeah. you need to make the best of what happens in that moment exactly and when you got the submission did you know you had it so i must say um in the but i yeah yes i've looked afterwards but in the coach let's say like this in the coach i had the the guillotine on yeah and i didn't feel like i'm going to tap him out or choke him out in that guillotine but afterwards i saw as well as i let go of the guillotine he didn't just gave up he almost passed out because yeah. as i let go of the guillotine he was like coming up and then he fell down back on my stomach yeah so he was not out completely but he was out of the guillotine so it was yeah. definitely on it what it, it it wasn't just his will to fight being broken yeah but uh as you said i want to go back to that as well is we have this thing as well adapt to change yeah and that's why um, we spoke about this earlier as well. It's like how everything prepped me for this as well throughout the years and so on. Because you need to abil uh, you need to have the ability, and that's our slogan as well for Sentinel of Nature. That's and the poaching company that we run and that we're busy setting up a facility and so on. But you need the ability to adapt to change. Although mm. it's going to take away that lead leg. Although I, it feels like I can't stand on this leg anymore. Although we got knocked down. Although it wasn't maybe a good fight as well well but we just kept on adapting to that change and we kept on going forward and we finished the fight at the end of the day yeah. so so yeah still just adapt to change and do whatever you need to do to get the outcome that you worked for every yeah. single day that's yeah. insane that's yeah. great as the champion the efc light heavyweight champion do you know what's next it's a very good question what's next i know i need to fix a lot of things so uh we started working on that straight from the bat um we'll just maybe cut this because i don't know if coach or either Gerard needs to see this but okay. i started training the day after <laughs> the day after the fight we definitely Bruce keeping did. this in it's yeah. kept in so my leg was yeah my leg was completely busted uh, of I, course my back wasn't in a, the the best condition let's call it that my face was yeah the day after my face didn't look good because but the day thereafter I was back in the gym actually there close by I was virgin active and yeah. I was just doing upper body stuff <laughs> and and then the day after that you yeah. went on a one yeah. week mission yeah yeah so the day after that so that <laughs> we fought the first day afternoon yeah Friday I was back in the gym um, Saturday, Sunday, basically. So almost the day after that. Saturday, Sunday, I started packing for for Sentinel of Nature. We had a course, an anti poaching course that we were running close to Swartdrechens. Okay. So that Monday, we were back doing patrols and back on our feet, back walking, back doing tracking, back doing waylays and doing stuff in the field. So that Monday, we were back up and running. There's this, yeah, yeah. We're not going to disclose. We we're, we're not going to disclose your injuries, but just yeah, exactly. like I, I, I remember because you went to Harrod the day after your fight. Yeah. If I, yeah. if I remember. Yeah, the correctly. day after that Friday. I, so I was so that Friday you were with a few hours later. I went to him as well. Yeah. yeah. And he told me. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, that guy shouldn't be doing anything. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, yeah. yeah. Well, I heard he's going away for yeah. a week. So yeah. it, it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Um did you so did you just think okay wait I'm going to take some pain medication and we just we, we committed to this this week away. <laughs> yeah, well, first of all like um, and that's actually, it goes back to the fight and then to, to what happened after the fight as well. You know, two weeks before the fight, I had the, the thing with my lower back as well, yeah. what happened. And it was actually injury that came back because of many years of fighting, um, back in 2011, I broken my lower back L4 actually don't want to say I've broken my lower back, but I've broken, I've cracked L4 and yeah in my lower back so yeah leading up to that fight two weeks before the fight we had a they well the doctor said it was a slip disc and it was around about i think it was l3 l4 somewhere and then l5 was pinching two nerves as well but the thing is i gave my word to Schlonga and i said listen i'm taking this fight so we're not just going to pull out the same with the anti-poaching stuff yes my leg is busted but and it was also students from over, it was international students. Yes. So I couldn't just pull out of it. Yes. I couldn't say, listen, yeah, your flight tickets and everything is booked for Sunday. I'm pulling out because I had a difficult fight. Yeah. It's it's unfortunately what we do and what we do every single day. And I teach it in such a way. And then I have to live up to it as well. It's not about me. It's not about the instructor. It's yes. not about the coach. It's about the people that we spend time with. It's about the people that we teach. I always transfer back to my family. I always say, 
if it was just about myself, <laughs> in life there was many difficult situations. So I would have gave up a long time ago. Yeah. But it's not about myself. It's not about me. It's about the people around me. It's about the people that I teach every single day. And for me, that was opportunity again that Monday to go out and teach more people, yes. to equip more people with knowledge and with skill set and with and with and with and with yeah. and so on and so forth. So yeah. And that was just, I think at the end of the day, that was my word. It was a commitment that I was supposed to do and what I committed to. And I had to do it, you know. Yeah. Still, although I knew what the injury was and, you, you know, and I think eventually like my mindset as well is like, um, I actually had a good discussion of coach this week as well. Like I always try to fix things like off the off the bat on on that day when somebody tells me listen yeah i need to fix my flexibility i want to do that day. i'll start like doing stretches that day if somebody <laughs> tells me i need to fix my tank i'll start running that afternoon yes like that's what makes it difficult for me with injury as well and i know at the end of the day it's not always a good thing but with injury it feels like i can't sit back I need to fix it today. So I yeah. will go to the gym today to try and fix it. It's not always the best way to fix it. <laughs> yes. but that, For me, in my mindset, it feels like that's how I'm fixing it. So I'm going to fix it that way. <laughs> that's, that's insane. Yeah. That's, but yeah I just think you have way too much energy, to yeah. be honest. <laughs> but so so yeah. let's chat a little bit about uh, Sentinel of Nature. And yes. um, w what was the thought process of, of starting, starting this journey, which is quite, not quite different, but it's also a, a very other type of focus group that you are now yeah. exploring into this company. Yeah. I think with Sentinel of Nature, um, being part of that company as an anti-poaching company, it, it takes me back to the roots. Why? Because I started anti-poaching when I was 15 years old. I started doing my courses through Specialized Wildlife Protection Academic, worked in anti-poaching and so on. So... Yeah, after Andy poaching, I went back into the first the cage fighting side after school and so on. And then I went into security and then it actually brought me back to the Andy poaching. And that's why we've seen especially the need for it around the world and not around the world, but especially around South Africa, around Africa and so on too. Not just because when people think Andy poaching, they always think rhinos. And it's not just mm. about the rhinos. It's protecting every single species and it's protecting humans as well. It's protecting yeah. that innocent law-abiding citizen as well so yeah i think st with 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 uh sentinel of nature and starting this company um with mowgli and nico and so on and started presenting training in in andy poaching as well it can provide the education but it can also provide awareness as well and that's what we want to do we want to at the end of the day always change the statistics yes. okay like when we teach people as well self-defense what do yeah. we do we're trying to change the statistics because yes. i don't want you to become part of the statistics so i train you to not basically kill somebody I train you to look after yourself and the people around you, yeah. not just yourself, the people around you as well. So I don't teach you to kill. I teach you to look after yourself. Yeah. So and that's the thing as well with Sentinel, with the anti-poaching and so on. We can give you the certain knowledge. The more knowledge I give to people, the more they can go and spread as well, the more the awareness is going to become and the more people is going to start to invest in anti-poaching and in anti-poaching units around the world, not just in South Africa, not just in Africa, maybe around the world. Yeah. And we can build the awareness because as soon as we put out the knowledge, we put out awareness as well. Yeah. So, yeah, I think for me, a big thing regarding Sentinel of Nature, it's going back to the roots and I just love spending time in the field. But it's not that I'm starting anti-poaching now after many years. I've been in it still. I've yes. been training multiple companies. Um, like just lately, I was at a big game reserve. Can't mention the name now. Um, I was at a big game reserve and we had training at that game reserve. As I left the game reserve, about two, three weeks after I left the game reserve, they were actually in a contact situation okay, and they wow. had huge success after that. So just recently we had success on the anti-poaching side as wow. well. So throughout the years, I kept on teaching and, you know, preaching anti-poaching as well. Yes. Kept on teaching civilians, law enforcement, military personnel, whatever you want to call it. But, uh, but yeah, as I said, for me, especially of the anti-poaching is going back to the roots and it's yeah. just, again, spending time in the field. And it's so nice to teach people, um, not just anti-poaching as well, but just teach people of fauna and flora, you know, being yes. in the field, spending time in the field, you're there, not 
basically running around in an urban setup and so yeah. on. So yeah, it's just it's such a nice time as well when we teach and do anti poaching. Or is that your it. is that your version of a holiday? Yeah, that's definitely it. <laughs> <laughs> we're teaching an anti poaching course, yes. but we're definitely on holiday because I'm the staying bush. in the field. Yeah, yeah. That's that's definitely it. <laughs> that is insane. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. those guys so they they got uh, like homework to be done straight after the, the course as well, exactly. which, which proved yeah, to be successful. Yeah, definitely. So I've seen it, especially with the international students as well. Mm. When they come in as well, it's like there's so much new knowledge for them. You can't also overload them with the knowledge because yes. there's so much, like not actually so much, like every single thing that you teach. Say, for instance, if you take a subject of tracking, yes, that's every single thing that you teach them, it's new. If those people are not coming from a military background or something like that, then mm. every single thing that you teach throughout that whole day, whether it's tracking, whether it's camera, whether it's, um, say, for instance, just doing a simple fence check, Every single yes. thing and the way you do it, it's new. So they have to take it in. And again, they have to go and basically go and process that, build their own system and start to understand the whole thing yeah. as well. So, yeah. As as someone that's that approaches it in a way of doing the protection, not only of the animals, but the people that serve on, yeah. on these yeah. reserves as well. Yeah. Um, do you enjoy hunting? <sighs> that's a very good question. I enjoyed hunting a lot a few years ago. and. The change come, the more and more and more I started working in anti poaching, the wow. less I started hunting. Okay. I haven't hunted for the past year and a half. Yeah. Almost, I think, going on two. Yeah. And I think just the cruelty that I saw from people going on to animals that like put a break on me just going out and hunt and so on. I have nothing against hunting. I have nothing against getting, um, providing for yourself and your family. Of yeah. course not. Um, that's also going back to the roots. But uh, for me, just being on the back of a bucky, shooting something, yeah. that's not hunting for me anyway. Yeah. But uh, as I said, nothing against hunting. But what I've seen in the field physically, if you've been in a field and you've seen a few things in the field and you see what people do to not just rhinos, do to just simple small animals as well in snares, doing snare, what we call the substance poaching, what they do to those animals as well, it's it's just something that you don't want to see. Yes. Okay? First of all, yes, you see them doing it to humans as well, especially in um, what we worked as well and what we do. I mean, we've been now in the security world for, for many years. Um, but especially then what people do to animals that can't look after themselves. Yeah. It is, it's insane. And that took me, that took me away a bit yes. from hunting. So, so yeah, I definitely, as I said, nothing against hunting. I've been hunting since I, I think I've started hunting, not think. I shot my first, um, uh, well, call it antelope. I shot my first antelope when I was five years old. Wow. Then okay. I started hunting because yes. I grew up on a farm as well. So I started hunting from the age of five. But as I said, over the last year or two, yeah, I haven't been hunting since. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's it's insane because my my uncle also has been um for for a bunch of years. He's been actually since he was in high school. Yeah. He expressed his interest in in going into the nature conservationist exactly. and he worked in in the Kruger, uh, Kruger. he worked in a, a few reserves around the Kruger as well exactly. uh, he's now in 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 the Sahara okay. but he has never displayed he has to sometimes shoot out you know yes. they need to yeah. control amounts I think that's pe what people also don't understand is part of con conservation is exactly. also conserving numbers definitely you know? part of conservation is also hunting yes and that's definitely it yeah. so so yeah no definitely that's part of it but uh yeah i think for the person for myself as well seeing mm. that and then still go out and hunt that's a difficult switch to yes. make as well yes maybe it's for the right purpose yes okay but it's still a difficult switch for myself yeah, yeah. i rather just want to look after the animals 100 yeah. percent, and that was my uncle's yeah. intention as well because i'm not going to say on the podcast that i feel more for animals than humans but yes. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Especially dogs. The family dog, he's yeah, safe. Yeah, so. yeah, no, definitely, definitely. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's uh, the, the type of approach that you guys, because obviously you're not alone in, in this. Yeah. Do you guys, when giving this training, do you guys split almost the focus group of all the training? Do you have like a specialist in, in the weaponry, specialist yeah. in tracking? Specialists yeah. in in the conservation, the fence checking, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, once so, 
I wouldn't say so diverse, but there's definitely always, I always want to send you to a specialist in this, to a specialist yes. and that, to this and that. It's like when we teach close quarter survival. Yes. So what we teach is CQS, we call it CQS, it's close quarter survival. And I teach it on the Bravo Tactical Africa as well. So basically what I always say is you need to form an integrated system. When I teach close quarter survival, I don't just want to teach you weapon platforms because you're not just always going to fight with the weapon platform. Yes. Maybe you're first going to have to fight with your hands, hand to hand. Yeah. And then eventually when you have the time and opportunity, you'll be able to get to your weapon platform. Yeah. Okay. But now all of a sudden, say for instance, you took a shot as well and you have massive bleeding. Say for instance, in the leg, in the arm, whatever the case might be, yes. you start to bleed out. Now you actually need that medical experience as well to be yes. able to stop the bleed and stay in the fight or stop the bleed and just keep yourself alive up until a professional can go to work. Yes. So again, now you actually need three different people that specialize in weapon platforms, yes. specialize in hand-to-hand, -hand, specialize in, say, for instance, the medical stuff as well. Don't yeah. want to so much call it medical because it's the basics what a civilian can apply just to keep them alive long yes. enough so that the professional can go to work so we always say the basics is going to keep you alive but yes i always and if i can't send you to someone i make sure i build up everything that i need to build up to give you the most and the best amount of knowledge that i can yeah. in weapon platforms in yeah. hand to hand in say for instance let's call it me medical but like just like say for instance tourniquet wound packing and so on yes. just the, the 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 basics that a normal civilian or somebody that's in the field as a ranger can apply just to keep that person alive yeah so yeah we always want to try to get a specialist in each and every field because unfortunately in life you can't be a specialist in every single thing yes you can't 100%. be in life you can't be a specialist in every yeah. single thing but at the end of the day you need enough knowledge of every single aspect as well or every single subject yes. because at the end of the day, we always talk about an integrated system. Mm -hmm. We talk about the weapon platforms. We talk about hand-to-hand -hand, and we talk about medical. But yeah. let's call that medical is just basically... Um, basic survival. Yeah, basic survival, mm -hmm. like stop the bleed or so on. As yeah. I said, I don't want to call it medical stuff because it's like tourniquets, wound packing and so on and so forth. Just massive bleeding, massive hemorrhage. And then you need to make it an integrated system because you can't think about it as if a fight is just say for instance weapon platforms there's no hand to hand yeah okay but it's not just hand to hand or weapon platforms maybe it's an integrated system so you need to know when to apply hand to hand and you need to know when and how to present your weapon platform although it was a hand to hand fight and all of a sudden it went to a weapon platform fight it started pulling a knife whatever the case might yes. be so you need to build that integrated system as well and now say for instance if you took a shot or a stab to the arm and you have massive bleeding you can't just take your gun and holster the gun and now slap on a tourniquet because yes. maybe you still have an active threat or attacker. Yes. You first need to neutralize that and now I can start to attend that massive bleeding, massive hemorrhage. Yes. So it's still at the end of the day, you need enough knowledge of each and every subject so that you can make it an integrated system. Yeah. It's like I always take the example to put it plain and simple and that I will teach on the marksmanship courses as well. It's like boxing and wrestling. Yes. Doing just boxing, it's easy. Not easy. Okay, don't yes. get me wrong. Doing just wrestling, that's easy. Again, not easy. Don't get me wrong. But now taking boxing yes. and taking wrestling and make it one world, let's call it mixed martial arts. Yeah. That's a different story. Definitely. So do you have a coach or instructor that can take your boxing, that can take your wrestling background and now make it mixed martial arts. Yeah. Now make it an integrated system. Yes. So same thing with what we teach. Although we do fence checks, although we do communication, although we do tracking, although we do navigation. Okay, at the end of the day, it's not a separate subject. It's an integrated system. You take all this and now you need the knowledge of anti poaching to be able to say, okay, this is all the subjects. How do we make it one? so that you can understand it as well. You can come and do the course. You can understand how we make this integrated subject and how can I apply this for the best outcome yeah. in a complex environment. Yeah, that's, it's, it's great, that's you know, because when, when people sometimes, taking it back to the sport of martial arts, when, when people ask <coughs> me, even with kids, you know, yeah, he's five, six years old, what would you suggest he, exactly. he starts with? Yeah. Start with everything. Exactly. Have a have a basic exactly. have a basic background. You do not have to be the best kickboxer in the world. Yeah. But if you have a 20, 30 percent knowledge as a young kid in three different styles, yes. in in longevity wise, it's gonna be very more profitable for you to be able to build off those bases exactly. and cover every base. How the 
the type of training that you guys do. Can you tell us a little bit of the type of groups that you have worked with before? Okay, so first of all, so nowadays, especially in South Africa and so on, we see a big market for civilians. But a type of groups we work for, so first of all, to give you a bit of a background on the Bravo Tactical Africa, what we do and what we present. So just to give you a short background um, on the Bravo Tactical Africa, we present courses, what we call close course survival. Why? Because in South Africa as well, we call it CQS. We don't call it CQB or CQC. We don't call it close quarter combat or close quarter battle. Why yeah. not? Because especially for us in South Africa, Africa, we want to survive that first initial attack as soon as possible. Yeah. And that's why we call it CQS, close quarter survival. So think about it like this, a plain and simple example I always give to the students, don't actually want to call it students, but to the people that attend the course is what's going to win a fight? And think about it like this, don't just think gun, 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 gun. Yes. What's going to win a hand-to-hand -hand fight? What's going to win a knife fight? What's going to win a gun fight? What do you think is going to win a fight? Okay, I know you know exactly what's going to win a fight. You've been <laughs> yeah. on a, like, a, what, almost <laughs> going for 10 and 0 now. Yes. So <laughs> you, you only know how to win. You yeah. don't know how to lose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what's going to win a fight? And that's why we call it close quarter survival. Yeah. So what's going to win a fight? Not being caught flat-footed and surprised. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So think about it if we talk guns as well. Do you think in a gunfight you're going to win if you just shoot in that direction? But you actually need to get a shot on target. You need to same definitely. As, exactly. Yeah. Same as when we punch as well. I always teach it like this because then I want to take away that mindset of just gun, 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 gun. Yes. So in the marksmanship entry level courses, I'll teach it as what's well, going to win a fight. Think about a first fight and yeah. I'll just throw punches in front of somebody. Yes. There's no punch landing. Is that going to win a fight? No. no. <laughs> so although you have all the power and speed in the world, it's not going to win a fight. Yeah. That first Accurate shot, boom, that's yeah. going to win a so fight. So you need precision exactly. in whatever you do. Exactly. Yeah. So that's why I always say the basics is going to keep you alive because yeah. what's the basics? It's that accurate punch. It's an yes. accurate shot that you're going to take. Yes, you can have all the tactical knowledge in the world, yes. but if you can't get an accurate shot on target, that tactical stuff is not going to help you because yeah. eventually I need to neutralize either the opponent or the attacker. Yeah. So that's why we always go back to survival, close quarter survival, because it's about surviving that first initial attack as soon as possible. Yeah. So that I can, especially in South Africa, when you do get attacked by multiple attackers, so that I can now start to shift my focus to the next attacker. Yeah. So yeah. So the, the close quarter survival course is a tailor-made course for both civilian and law enforcement applications. And it teaches survival of what deemed to be worst case scenario you might end up in, like being ambushed, caught flat-footed and totally surprised. Now, the groups that we've worked for, um, with, basically, so first of all, a lot of civilians. We train a lot of civilians, yes. week in and week out, weekends especially. Um, we train a lot of farmers as well. Over weekends, I'll travel to, say, for instance, Nelspreet, Limpopo, all around South Africa. That has, been, that has become so, a game. Like, yeah. you, in the start of the week, we were like, okay, where were you? Yeah. Where were you <laughs> exactly. this weekend? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, no, I'm down at Durban. Yes. Yeah. yeah, Not going to the Beach, yes. teaching, close quarter survival, <laughs> yeah. you know, teaching. And so, yeah, so first of all, a lot of civilians. We worked with a lot of security personnel as well in South Africa, multiple companies, not going to mention names now, yes. but but multiple companies, uh, companies, sorry, on the security side. And then, yeah, of course, we lately have the privilege or had the privilege to train a special task force of South Africa as well. Wow. And we presented... Um, Basically, what they call a care under fire, but let's talk about it as massive bleeding, massive hemorrhage and so on, and integrated the weapon platforms into that as well. So we did a stop the bleed course for them, but integrated the weapon platforms as well. That is so, so, yeah, we basically presented that to them as well. So, and yeah, we worked with a special task. With, we've worked with um, certain law enforcement agencies. We worked with security personnel, and yeah. we work a lot. A big passion of mine is to work with civilians and equip civilians because we can see there's a lot of testimonies that came out over the, especially the last few weeks as well, not just coming from law enforcement or military or the special task force, but mm. coming from civilians. Yes. Okay. People that do what they're supposed to do and stay alive. Yeah, that yeah. is insane. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I, as I understand, you are the first person outside the military that the special talk, task force basically got in for, for training? 
Uh, well, I believe so in specifically the cause that we presented. Okay. So uh, definitely the specific cause that we that presented. That feel good. That was something, <laughs> yeah, no, that was something <laughs> that was completely new, not completely new to them. They yes. most definitely, especially the group that we worked with, most definitely have seen some, previously seen some um, stop the bleed training, maybe a bit of tourniquets and wound yes. packing and so on. But specifically that cause that we presented to them, even those, let's call it operators that were on the course, yeah. that was something they haven't seen before. Yes. And that was so fantastic because just lately we had a success. We had a testimony coming from them as well because of that specific course. So that, that was amazing. Sense. I that know was, there is a lot of it. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're not allowed to talk about that, no. that too much. But do they like, do they send you a WhatsApp? Like, how do they make <laughs> contact with you? How, yeah. how, how do yeah. those... How do you progress from doing these courses to having these guys yeah. trust you basically with very sensitive knowledge? Yeah, that, that's a good question as well. I think you build up trust through the relationship that you build up with, with them as well. So, yeah. so yeah, recently with the success that we had with them as well, I received the WhatsApp. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that so, is okay. really, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> not a okay. phone call like yeah. one o'clock at night, so listen, you know, with a private number. So they didn't no, th throw... Uh, we talk casually on WhatsApp as well, okay. but... But uh, I must say when I was down in Durban now, I was standing in front of a group and as I was teaching for civilians in Durban, that testimony came through from wow. the from yeah, from the special task force as well. So that was that was just amazing yeah. to see and hear that as well. Because we actually um again not to mention names, but we had that testimony. We had a testimony just uh, I think uh, about three weeks ago from a civilian yes. in Joburg. We had a testimony coming from a game reserve as well in yes. anti-poaching. It's three different worlds yeah. and all three was a success. Wow. So that's amazing to be able to know, okay, we're teaching close quarter survival for that civilian. Yes. He survived in that situation. We're teaching not anti-poaching, but also what I've teach in that game reserve is how to run your gun. Yes, okay. <laughs> and that kept him alive. Yes. And then, of course, we had the, the massive bleeding, stop the bleed and so on for the special task force as well. And we combined that with the weapon platforms. Yeah. And there was a success as well. So that's amazing just to take three different complete different environments let's call it three complete different operators because yes. what they do how they do it every single day it's co completely different yes. and all three had success wow and that was just the past few weeks so that, that was amazing that was for us and again it's not it's not about us at the end of the day that specific person that's giving that testimony needs to step up in that situation yes. so that's why i always say like listen yeah you are here today and we always have this thing on the private tactical africa when we present the course you most probably heard it before as well i always say justify the why yeah okay when you go to a course go to that course with an open mind and ask yourself listen yeah whatever i'm going to take in from this instructor from this coach justify will this be applicable for myself the way i move the way i react the way i see for my body mechanics and so yeah. on and so forth and the way we do get attacked of course in south africa as well okay yes. not want to don't want to talk just violence and violence and violence but the way we do get attacked as well you need to justify the why ask yourself why will this be applicable you can't just take anything from the instructor you need to go and justify it. so okay yes this is going to work for me but this is the reason yes why it's going to work for me yeah so yeah always just justify the why ask yourself why will this be applicable yeah. i always say you need to understand the concept behind the technique okay yeah. uh, with with the subject of technique um I, i'm not sure if you're allowed to talk on that but as an instructor that worked with this task force um were you overly impressed with yeah. their with their knowledge and understanding obviously like Having just the weapon itself yeah. is a very small yes. part of their job. Yeah, but but very over, small part. But yeah. overall, as a team, as yeah. how they work, were you impressed with them? Uh, yeah, I was. Yeah, it was a huge, first of all, huge privilege yeah. to be able to operate with them just on the range, okay? Just to see how they operate, how they integrate as a team as well. Because as you said, and you actually, that's that's perfect what you said. It's the, the handgun that they carry the rifle or just call it a rifle for now, what they carry as well, primary, secondary weapon platform. Yeah. That's a very small part of what they do actually. And it was so nice to actually just be able to, if I can call it that, be able to assist in that small part yeah. of what they do and just to, to give them more knowledge, give them um, more tools in their toolbox to be able to hopefully like never apply it in a complex environment. But then they've applied it just a few weeks or a week ago or so and it worked. 
Yeah. Okay. And it saved the life as well. So, yeah. So first of all, I was definitely impressed with the standard that the special task was still set in South Africa. That's yes. amazing to see. And the way they work as a team, that was even more amazing. Okay. How that, how they will stand next to each other and do what they're supposed to do. Yes. And then one thing I must say that I haven't seen in South Africa is their ability adapt, to adapt to change. The okay. ability to basically, and I think that comes from experience as well, because I've seen it on the range. I'll tell them something, okay, I don't want to say I'll tell them something, but I'll teach them something, yes. a concept. Yes. They'll take it. I don't have to say it again. They'll take it and immediately apply it. Wow. And apply it according, basically, how they operate. Yes. That, that was just amazing. The ability to adapt to what you're giving them and adapt that like on the spot i don't have to say something more than once on that course they take it immediately and they build it into their system that was so amazing and i think that makes you a special task force operator as well the ability to take in something and immediately make it part of your armory like make it part of your system and build it in not just take it and say okay all this is going to work for me no this is going to work for me i add it boom and i apply it immediately and that was amazing to see their ability to adapt to change is insane that is that's awesome there's like it it makes me think of two books uh, the rise of superman and stealing fire is where they and special operators are actually massive examples in both those books of flow states where exactly these guys are are very they are so highly trained that they can so easily go into that flow exactly. state could you see them working together like very well in that type of flow states environment w- Def- when they in that in that definitely, environment definitely because yeah. that specific cause that we present is also a cause where you need to work together so say for yes. instance one of the guys is down will simulate say for instance somebody took a shot to the leg yes. okay he's maybe down and out not down and out completely but he's bleeding out somebody needs to apply a tourniquet somebody needs to apply cover fire whatever the case might be and the way they work together and the way they communicate as well that was just insane to see as well the way you can see it's always like i've seen it a lot civilians wants to do like teamwork stuff as well they want to mm-hmm. work in a team but the problem is they're not together every single day yes. with a special task force you can see they're working as a team because they are together every single day yes. they work together every single day and that you can see translate onto the range as well when they step onto the range you can see yes these people are working together every single day yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. It's not like yes, we're just attending a course and now we want to start to communicate. They've yes. been communicating before. You can see that. That is yeah, awesome. They know exactly what to say and when to say it. That's very so, cool. So now, yeah, that's amazing. I'm, I'm going to jump topic now a little bit and no, it's going to probably sound very stupid. But <laughs> like you see almost a, a type of desensitization of uh of combat training combat application in like video games yeah like yeah. what do you think of that <laughs> like it's it's uh, really it's something that people are, i don't think people have a very good understanding yeah. of like how intense and yeah. how how really uh, aggressive and violent it can be yeah. and then, yeah. you know like my brother was six years old when he started yeah. playing call of duty like exactly uh, what do you <laughs> what do you think of of yeah. that uh, that part of it you know what i'm gonna answer it coming this way and i don't know if it's a good thing but i'm going to talk about it so what i will say is yes and i think you need to prep i think you need to have especially all the gear if you can have say for instance a battle belt and a plate carrier and so Mm. on that you have the ability to look after yourself and the people around you yeah but then there's a thing that we typically forget about and it's easy to put on that plate carrier just to go to the range that's easy but if you put and that's a different mindset if you put that plate carrier over your head and you know that this might save my life in the next 10 minutes. Yes. That's a different feeling. Yes. Some people is just going to take off that plate carrier and go and hide underneath the couch. Yes. Then putting off the plate carrier and doing what they're supposed to do. Yes. So unfortunately, we can have all the training. We can have all the setups in the world. We can play the video games. We can, I always say, <laughs> there's a huge that. difference between talking violence yes. and applying violence. Yeah. Unfortunately, that goes back to the mindset. Unfortunately, that's going to go back to the mindset at the end of the day. The mindset of, let's put on this plate carrier. It's so nice to go to the range of this whole setup, battle belt yes. and rifle. Not saying you're not supposed to set yourself up for success. With that, if you have the extra resources available and you can start to focus on gear-related stuff like that, 
not just every day carry what you have on you every single day if you can focus upon that and you have the extra resources yeah, start yes start to invest in that as well yeah but just keep in mind when you throw that plate carrier on on the range and when you throw it on over your head and you know that plate carrier might just save your life in the next 10 minutes there's a different mindset. Yes. So make sure you train with the right mindset. And that's the thing. And I think that's the huge difference between the two. It's so easy to see and to think. Yes. And to talk violence. Yeah. But to apply it, that's a different story. Yeah. And I think especially you've seen it as well. And everybody's yes. seen it, that's especially in the cage fighting world as well. It's so easy to sit there behind the laptop in your mom's basement and be like, oh yeah, I would have done a straight right on that. Oh, I would have done the left duke on that. That's easy. <laughs> yes, 100%. Yeah. But uh, go step into that cage yes. when the whole world is watching you, especially on the stage that you're fighting. Yeah. You step into a cage, they close the door and the go, doors go click. Yeah. It's a different story. It is. Yeah. I, I'm oh, oh, yeah. Like exactly. Yeah. 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 Are you still going to throw that yeah. straight right that you told me about in your mom's basement yeah. on the laptop? <laughs> and then, you, But then you also revert back to that instinct as well. Exactly. It's, you revert back to your training. You revert back to muscle memory. Exactly. Because under pressure, that that is what you're going to apply. Definitely. On, Definitely. on that to topic, can you run us through your EDC as well? Okay, so EDC, yeah. so, okay, this was discussed beforehand just to yes. put it on the podcast. The handgun is safe. So what I carry with me, before we go, we just spoke about all that, you know, throwing on that, that all that gear that you see on the yeah. video. <laughs> yeah. So what I'm a true believer of is set yourself up for success with what you carry every single day. Because mm -hmm. most probably if something happens to you or the people around you, it's going to happen when you have what's on you every single day. Yes. Okay, you're not going to set yourself up as a civilian, especially take it now in a civilian context. You're not going to set yourself up with that plate carrier and that battle belt and that rifle and so on. And now you're going to get attacked. Most yes. probably not. You're going to get attacked most probably when you least expect it. Yeah. And when you have everything that's on you, what you carry with you every single day. So let me take you through that. So every day carry for me. Okay. And it's going to be different for some people. But for me, it's about what I can carry with me every single day. Okay. Every day carry is not every now and then. It's every day carry. It's yes. in the word. It's every, it's almost EDDC. It's every damn day carry. Okay. It's not, yeah, it's yes. not just every day carry. Oh, I just have it for the podcast. Yeah. Or oh, I just have it for, <laughs> this is my EDC. Because people tend to, if you know the EDC community, likes to take a photo and be like, this is my EDC. Yeah. Do you carry that? Monday to Sunday, every single day with you. The only time when it's off your body, most probably when you're sleeping, yes. when you're showering, because it's uncomfortable to carry concealed when you're naked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. when you go to the gym as well. I don't have my gym back, but most probably when you go to the gym, if you really set yourself up for success, you have an off-body carry back or something yeah. like that. Um, so yeah, the rest of the time it's everyday carry. So for the purpose of the podcast, the handgun is unloaded and safe, but to take you through the EDC, uh, let's do a, like a pocket dump. Yes, so first please. of all, um, I want to say this before we start, when we talk about EDC, okay, I think, uh, Pac McNamara has a saying, okay, okay. the mind is the final weapon. <laughs> okay. All else is supplemental uh, keep that's that cool. in mind that's so this sick. you can edc every yeah. single day yeah that's you cool. can go through all the airports around the world with this yeah okay but not with what you have on you sometimes you have to leave this in the safe unfortunately yes yeah <laughs> so the mind's the final <laughs> weapon all else is supplemental that's keep cool. that in mind situational awareness is most probably going to keep you alive before yeah. all this is going to keep you alive that's awesome okay so pocket them. let's start with uh um, let's start with this so i always if i don't have a weapon mounted light on me i have a handle flashlight so just okay. a handle flashlight. Okay, that's always in my pocket if I don't have a weapon mounted light. Yes. Not gonna say I'm not gonna say I'm carrying both. Okay. It's for me it's sometimes a handle flashlight. Okay, sometimes a weapon mounted light. Okay. Okay. So that's it. And then on the support side, we call it weapon side support side. Then of course we have just a normal push dagger. Yes. Okay. This is actually my design. I designed it with Edgy Eddie, sorry, <laughs> from Mojo Knives. It's a push dagger. Okay. So basically, it's sitting on the support side. You just grab it in between any two fingers. It yes. can be the index, middle finger. It can be the middle ring finger. If you put it out, it's just a push dagger like this. What yeah. I like about this, basically, is I don't have to teach you any new techniques to use this. Yes. If you're throwing a straight right on a heavy bag, on pads, whatever the case might be, you learn how to stab with it or straight left, whatever the case yeah. might be. Throwing a hammer first, you learn how to slice with it. So yes. I don't have to teach you any new techniques. As soon as it comes out, it's ready to go. It's a fixed blade. Okay. Yeah. But I'm not going to talk about the design and why they design it and so on. 
you want to know more, you can just attend the course. Yes, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, so definitely. That's basically the push agar. That's the knife that I carry with me every single day. Um, and then I have a tourniquet with me. So just for, say, for instance, uncontrolled bleeding on the limbs, um, so arms you, or legs. So you wear that as a belt as well? So, yeah, I have a belt, but I okay. wear this exactly the same as the belt. It goes around your body. The reason why I have the rats, yes, most people, um, not most, but a lot of people won't agree with carrying a rat's tourniquet. Okay. But I found for me, this is something that I can carry every single day with me because it's not a tourniquet that's going to stop the bleed on the arms or the legs that I have to put in my pocket and it's bulky like your yes. Swati or like your, your cat or like your um, Sam XD or something like that. It is something that I can carry around the waist and it just goes through the loops yes. around my belt, around the waist, and I can carry this concealed every single day on me and I have a tourniquet with me. Yes. Okay. Rather have one than not need it, they need it and not have, have one. one yeah. So that's just like a, for me about this tourniquet. This can at least just like, Again, as I always say, basic is going to keep you alive. It can keep you alive long enough so that the professional can go to work. It can keep you alive long enough so that I can now get to my cat tourniquet that's in the vehicle. Yes. Or something like that. But that's the rat's tourniquet. It's just to stop bleeding on the extremities, upper or lower extremities, legs or arms. And then, of course, the normal belt for me, just going around the waist, is a big part of your EDC as well. Okay. Why? Because that's going to hold all of your gear. It's yes. going to hold my knife. It's going to hold my tourniquet. And especially it's going to hold my weapon platform. Okay. Okay. So the weapon platform is just basically carrying appendix. It's a sidecar setup, meaning as you can see for the podcast, weapon platform is safe. There's no magazine in, there's nothing in the yeah. chamber as well. So just a weapon platform with a spare magazine. Yes. Okay. So I'll just have two magazines on me, one in the mag pouch over here. Okay. It's just a sidecar setup. And then of course, typically the magazine that will be in the weapon platform yes. as well. So that for me basically is EDC. It's just a, a pocket dump. And this, uh, this that's a Glock 43 or that's 19? That's a Glock 19. Okay. So that's the Glock 19. Um, this is still a Gen 3, first or uh, Gen 3 generation basically. Yes. Okay, and then it has just normal pair of night sights on it and so on. So plain and simple. Nothing yes. fancy on the Glock 19. And uh, yeah, just to have a T Rex arms holster, sidecar setup, and what I carry appendix. I like to carry the appendix. The reason being is because it's in the workspace. Yes. Same as when you're in that vehicle, it's in the workspace. Yeah. I don't have to reach for something on my side or behind me, whatever the case might be. So everything that I carry is typically in my workspace. Yeah. Okay. If my life is going to depend upon it, like the knife, like the weapon platform, whatever the case might be, or the handgun, it's going to be in my workspace. I just yeah. like carrying it in the workspace. Yeah. So yeah. That's just a, a quick pocket dump. And then the last one is this thing right that's, here. That's it. That's it. <laughs> yeah. the, the final weapon. Yeah, and all awesome. else is supplemental. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Because I always teach it like this as well. Um, I always say, you most probably, the environment's going to kill you before the threat or the attacker is going to kill you. So I've seen it especially with anti-poaching. And that's why you have to carry this with you every single yeah. day. I've seen it especially in anti-poaching. You're more likely to get killed by the elephants the rhinos, the buffaloes, yes. whatever the case might be, the lions, then getting killed by the poacher. Yes. And same exact thing. Say, for instance, you fight in an urban environment as a civilian, you're more likely to get taken out by the environment than by the skill set of the attacker. Yes. You're more likely to move and slip, trip, and fall over a sidewalk because of your lack of awareness of the environment and be static in the open than yes. basically getting taken out by the skill set of the threat or the attacker. Yes. But as I said, especially in anti-poaching, you can see it as well. You're more likely to get killed by the environment yeah. than by the skill set of the poacher. That's and that's why we always say this is the final weapon. That's awesome. That's <laughs> All else great. is supplemental. That's yeah, great. Situational awareness you have to carry with you every yeah. single day. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking yeah. like, I, I don't have any of this equipment yet, but I still need to work on this yeah. thing right over here. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. At least you have a, well, it's now not a push dagger. It's, you have yes. a Glock knife, but again, I'm not sponsored by Glock, but at least you know this knife is never going to malfunction. Do and it's always going to stay sharp. <laughs> yeah, do you hear that CZ? <laughs> yeah, CZ. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Actually, I don't even think there's a CZ knife. I don't uh, think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No. They they're yeah. not they're not as thoughtful as that. <laughs> oh yes. They are. They thank yeah. you so yeah, much exactly. for, for your time. Thank you for no, running us through pleasure. it. What you are doing, like I said in the in the start of the podcast, what you do inside the cage is absolutely amazing. But what you, you do outside outside that cage is is yeah. really life saving. Not only to operators, but to 
countless civilians and i i really believe that you'll get more testimonies as you as you continue your good work it's yeah. it's insane yeah yeah thank yeah. you so much i appreciate it john awesome. thank you for for having me on the podcast as well it was a huge privilege yeah and uh yeah then yeah. i'll see you on the mat also if you guys <laughs> want to go check out uh jc's instagram all his social media stuff will be in the description below go check out bravo tactical africa go check out sentinel of nature we'll put everything in the de description if you are listening to this and you didn't watch it make sure to go to youtube go watch it go check out the equipment that is on the table right here it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much thank you thank I you appreciate for it. it thanks have a great day. Make sure to like, subscribe. Let us know what you guys think and enjoy. Cheers.